Good evening, folks. Welcome to another episode of Lori's Talk News Radio. Thursday, May the 16th, 2013. Uh, this evening, we're having uh, Tom Press on with us. It's kind of a debut, the beginning of a, a series here. And we've titled it just for beginners, Tom Press Dispels Futurism. And the other day, I ended up rattling off a bunch of these $68,000 words or whatever they are, you know, these fanciful words that everybody seems like to use. And we wanted to try to define some of those. Now, I don't want to put Tom on the spot. I know he's looking at some of them. I know that Tom is primarily going to be focused in on futurism, which is fine and well and good. But my thing is is starting out at dispensationalism and and covenant theology because those, from what I can tell, those are the two main uh, the main trunk, the main branches, the big first split. Then you end up with things off of the dispensational side, like this future of uh, futurism and and uh, not preterism and all, all kinds of. I mean, it just goes like an octopus from there. Anyway, that being said. Uh, I'm hoping that, uh, Tom, you there, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself, and I'd like to welcome you to the show. Thanks for watching. Hi, good evening, Lori. Nice to be with you, and good evening to your listeners. Well, good evening. Um, so we were going to, we had just decided that when we did this, we were going to try to define a couple of these words, uh, how it affects the way somebody looks or understands Scripture, Yes. And then we're going to get like right into the, the one of the things that you believe to be one of the biggest meat and taters. I'll just put it that way, the, the, right at the heart of this issue. Do you want me to to spill the beans where that is now there in uh, that book, or do you want to do it? That's fine with me. Do as you please. Okay. Well, so that everybody can look it up, a couple things. Tom says we all need a piece of scrap paper because we're going to be adding some numbers. Nothing big, just a couple of numbers, but the chapter, and the book chapter and verse is Daniel chapter 9 and verse 26. I'm sure we'll be reading a little bit on either side of that, but that, that's where we're heading, so uh, there's nothing more musical to my ears than that of flipping Bible pages. However, I don't hear it through this computer, but that's okay. I'll pretend like I'm hearing it. Anyway, Tom, why don't you go ahead and take it away? And by the way, whenever you feel need for a break, you let us know, because we usually go straight through, but we do have people like to take a break, go wet the whistle, and whatever else not. So yeah. take her away. Okay, well, you and I were in discussion about dispensationalism. And what that really boils down to when you cut away all the fat and get to the meat of dispensationalism, it, it, it suggests one means of salvation for the Gentile and another means of salvation for the Jew. And that might sound confusing to some people, but we'll explain that completely. I think uh, uh, the listeners can comprehend what we're saying. I think they'll come to the same conclusion. First of all, we have been told uh, a lie, a lie that has a consequence. And that consequence is to blind us to blind us to who Antichrist is. The Protestant reformers were what we call historicists. They saw in history Antichrist. Every single Protestant reformer, from the most popular to the, to the least of them, every Protestant reformer to the man said that the papacy is the Antichrist and that the, the Roman Catholic Church is the synagogue of Satan. Now that's going to sound shocking to people, but I beg your listeners to just do their research themselves and read the writings of the Protestant reformers. But that's not what we believe today, and that's because we've been told a lie. What we, we talk about in the churches today is what is called as futurism. And the, the idea that Antichrist doesn't come until the 70th week of Daniel, okay? The last seven years before Christ returns. That's what we're told to believe anyway. And that's what I'm going to deal with tonight. But first of all, the papacy, during the period of the Protestant Reformation, when the news spread 
after uh, men began to read the Bible for themselves in their own language and began to comprehend the message of the scriptures, and particularly the prophecies, they they came to no other conclusion that there, 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 there were no there was no other option but that the papacy fulfilled every every word of prophecy regarding Antichrist, the man of sin, son of perdition, he that exalts himself above the stars of God, okay, calls himself God on the earth. And as a result of that knowledge, people began to flood out of the Roman Catholic Church in obedience to the command of Revelation chapter 18, verse 4 and 5. Come out of her, my people, that you partake not of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. For God hath remembered her iniquities. And this is what was taught by the Protestant reformers, that Revelation chapter 17 described none other than the Roman Catholic Church in vivid, colored detail. In other words, if you were to draw a, a, a painting of what is described in Revelation chapter 17 and then look at that, at that painting, you could then recognize the Roman Catholic Church as being the fulfillment of those prophecies. And, uh, and of course, Revelation chapter 17 begins by saying, this is the judgment of the great whore. So the papacy, in order to counter the Protestant Reformation, began what is known today as the Counter-Reformation. It began officially by the formation of the Jesuit order and the first and the first ecumenical council called immediately after their formation was the Council of Trent. And at the Council of Trent all of the beliefs of the Protestants were condemned. And and and, and, and Protestants were, were then declared to be heretics and it was also declared that it was no crime to kill a heretic. So the Roman Catholic Church went on the crusade or on the inquisitions to silence this growing belief among Christians that the papacy fulfilled all the prophecies regarding Antichrist. And that, that, that war continues even today. And one of the methods by which the papacy attempted to destroy this, this, this spreading knowledge was to create alternative belief systems, alternative uh, uh, interpretations of Bible prophecy that would virtually exclude the papacy as even a possibility of being Antichrist. Tom, I, I'd like to, to jump in here for just a moment because one of the things, and I, I didn't, like I said, I didn't start my roots, per se, on futurism uh, exactly. Mine was, was more along dispensationalism. And it's interesting because you said you had mentioned about Daniel's 70th week and that, that, you know, effectively what they teach is nothing happens until, of the Lord, anyway, until just before the Lord's return. And right. anything that does happen that way is of Satan, which I'm not gonna, we'll get in that later, who and what they're turning the Holy Spirit into and so on and so forth. But one of the things NJ and I were talking about here the other day that I, I brought up to her, here in uh, Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 1, this is in red, folks. Uh, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door, when you read above and below there, you'll find out that's Christ's door, yes. that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold. Now, that's very important. He's saying into the sheepfold, but climbing up some other way is a thief and a robber. So he's right. already told us there is another way to get to the sheepfold. He knows who they are because... Well, that's the whole matter of study. Point is, he's talking about some other way, and you you touched on that before. And I just wanted to point out this whole dispensationalism thing, where everything ends at the destruction of the temple, and nothing happens until just before the Lord comes. So I just wanted yeah. to type that in. Yeah, they teach today that there's a two thousand year parenthetical uh, interruption between the sixty ninth and the seventieth week. And it's simply not so. And I'll show it to your listeners so that everyone can understand. It's just a simple twisting of the scripture, just like Satan did when he tempted Jesus in the desert 40 days uh, before he went to his, uh, his sacrifice for us. And uh, when, when we forget about what the church teaches us and just read the words in the scripture, 
then it's easy to see the truth. And it, and it makes far more sense than anything that, that at least I've been taught in the churches. And uh, we're not trying to mislead anybody. We're trying to correct uh, the error that is taught in the churches, particularly on a key passage of Scripture in Daniel chapter 9. But getting back to what I was saying, since everybody began to recognize that the papacy fulfilled the prophecies of Antichrist, and the people were flooding out of the Roman Catholic Church to the point where the Roman Catholic Church was threatened, the papacy was threatened. I mean, it doesn't do any good to be pope if you have nobody to be pope over, right? So he had to, he had to save himself. And the only way to do it was to begin to offer alternative interpretations of the prophecies that virtually exclude the papacy from even being a possibility for, for Antichrist. And first of all, he, they recruited Jesuits to do this. The first Jesuit <clears throat> who went uh, about trying to find in the scriptures a way to twist them so that <clears throat> uh, uh, no one could, could any longer accuse the papacy of being Antichrist was a Jesuit priest by the name of Alcazar. And he taught that the, the prophecies in Daniel literally... Uh, proclaimed that all the end time prophecies were fil- fulfilled by the by 70 A.D. and that and that or near or so, or, or 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 soon after that. And it was taught one of the one of the alternative teachings was that Nero was the Antichrist, and it was the papacy that destroyed Nero. And now Nero, now Antichrist is out of the picture. Nobody has to be concerned about Antichrist. And, and now we can focus all of our attention on the papacy and the building of a global Christian religion. So, so Tom, the, the two things you just mentioned there really are known as, as futurism and preterism. But the, the operative here is either He's already come and gone and been destroyed, or he's yeah. so far off in the future, there's no point looking for him now. Yeah, just stop and look back, look, stand back and look at both of these interpretations of Bible prophecy, and it becomes clear what the motive is. To, to get Antichrist out of the picture, quit giving anybody any reason to talk about Antichrist. He's either long gone back in the days of Nero, or he's so far in the future, nobody needs to be concerned about it. And just in case somebody still remains concerned about Antichrist, uh, they come up with the rapture doctrine to say that we'd all escape the the, uh, the so-called great tribulation, the seven years of tribulation. Now, all of this is familiar to almost all of your listeners. They've all heard this before. This is taught in all the churches today. And I haven't said anything that is that most people aren't already acquainted with. <clears throat> but we have to understand, if we stand back and look, that Alcazar, the Jesuit priest, came up with preterism. And that's a term used to describe the idea that Nero or Antiochus Epiphanes or some other character in antiquity was the Antichrist, and he's been done away with, and he's no longer a factor. Then we have the futurist interpretation of Bible prophecy, and that was put forward by another Jesuit priest by the name of Ribera. And this is the thesis based on Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24 and through 27. And it twists that Bible prophecy, that prophecy of Daniel, and makes it appear that this so-called 70th week of Daniel doesn't occur until there's a new nation of Israel in the world and that there's a new temple built and that the Jews have been permitted to begin animal sacrifices again. And then this covenant that allows the Jews to begin animal sacrifices again is all of a sudden and abruptly broken in the midst of the, of the peace treaty. And then everybody knows who Antichrist is. Whoever breaks that treaty is the Antichrist, and that's who everybody's waiting for. And who does this protect? This protects the papacy, who was always known as the Antichrist. This is something your listeners need to understand. Preterism and futurism are the new kids on the block. They're the youngest perversion of the truth to come about. 
And they came about after the formation of the Jesuit order, after the Protestant Reformation, and the beginning of the Counter-Reformation. The Roman Catholic Church particularly put the Jesuit order out front to counter the Protestant Reformation. And since the Bible was the fuel that propelled the Protestant Reformation, they had to pervert people's understandings of the Bible, particularly Bible prophecy, and most particularly Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 26. And they were extremely successful in that effort. But now it's time to take a dose of reality. And if anybody's got any questions about futurism or preterism or what they were created and intended to do, I'd be glad to answer any questions. But it it suffice it to say that until preterism came around and until futurism came around, everyone was what we know today as historicists. They saw Antichrist all throughout history. Okay, they understood that when Paul talked to the Thessalonians, he said, he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then that man of sin shall be revealed, that wicked, that son of perdition, right? Well, Paul, Paul was speaking to the Thessalonians, and he had spoken to them face to face. So you know uh, Paul went into much greater detail, but when he wrote his letter to the Thessalonians, he made veiled references to who this man of sin is so that the Thessalonians, if, if the letter had ever been captured by the Romans, uh, they'd have been under tremendous persecution. 24, 5, and in order, I'm getting some... Uh, audio from somewhere. Well, I think NJ maybe had unmuted her phone or something there by accident, I'm hoping. Okay. But anyway, so Paul spoke in rather clandestine terms, but he knew the people that he was writing to understood what he was saying. He said, he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then that man of sin shall be revealed. Notice he said, he who now lets or he who now restrains will continue to restrain until he's taken out of the way, and he will restrain the rise of Antichrist. So all we have to do to find out who Paul was talking about is look back in history. Who was he talking about? Who was restraining the rise of Antichrist at the time? Well, who was in control? Caesar, the pagan of the pagan Roman emperor, empire, the emperor, Caesar. And history records that not long after these days, the emperor Caesar Constantine left Rome, left the Roman Empire, and handed it over to the Bishop of Rome, who later became the Pope. So the papacy is what rose up in the absence of Caesar. And this is what all Bible believers believed from that time on. There's never been a departure from the true body of Christ from that belief. The Albigensians believed that the the papacy was the Antichrist. The Waldenses believed. The Hussites believed. The Protestant Reformers believed. Everyone shouted it from the rooftops. That was the belief of the Reformed faith, of true biblical faith, was historicism. They saw in the papacy, everybody agreed, they saw in the papacy the Antichrist. And that's been the the main belief of Bible believers ever since the creation of the papacy. But we've been told a lie. And that lie came from a simple twisting of the Scripture. And I want to show your listeners where it is so that they can identify it for themselves, so that they can completely understand it, and so that they can teach others how we've all been deceived. And now we're free to believe the truth. We're free to believe what the Protestant Reformers believed, what the Albigensians believed, what the Waldensians believed, what the Hussites believed what all true Bible believers have always believed. The very reason why their blood was shed in the mountains of the Alps, why they were massacred in France, 
why they were killed relentlessly throughout history, why the earth is soaked with the blood of the prophets and the the saints and all of the slain of the earth. Rome pursued these people who would not bow down to the papacy and accept him as the representative of God on earth. They killed them all, as many of them as they possibly could. <clears throat> and this is all information that is, is basically left out of our history books. We're not aware that papacy, the papacy, the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist, has been persecuting God's people for nearly 2,000 years, while all the world today looks around for Antichrist and can't see him. They either see him in the long distant past in the preterist interpretation of Bible prophecy, or they see him in the far distant future in the futurist interpretation of Bible prophecy, and gone is any belief in futurism. Well, well, Tom, that's interesting because one of the things, as as many tactics, I mean, you can get off into the Illuminati and Skull and Bones, rich men of the earth, but, but where I'm going with this is it's interesting because I brought up on this show before, we had what we called the Dark Ages. And it's like, I like to joke people, it's not because we didn't have electric lights, okay? It's yeah. because the Bible was not available to people in a language they could understand. And it That's was right. Rome that kept the Latin Vulgate that only the intelligentsia read, and that's why they had all their icons, their stained glass window, was because they told them a story through these pictures and idols that they wanted them to get. And it was very overt. Uh, when when, when, when a, a priest backed in that, and you will be excommunicated, these people quaked in their boots. Well, when yeah. a cat was out of the bag with Martin Luther and the Reformation and stuff, uh, they couldn't do it overtly anymore. They had to start doing it covertly, and now they've been doing that through the, and I'm quoting here, the education system. So it went from overt <coughs> to covert. Yeah. What you're talking about is the counter-reformation. And those institutions that you mentioned, the Illuminati and and the others that you mentioned, are just warriors in the Counter-Reformation to destroy the knowledge that the papacy is antichrist and, and, and to promote in the world an earthly kingdom of Christ rather than a heavenly one. An earthly counterfeit kingdom of Christ under the authority of the papacy, a global government by the Pope versus a heavenly government by Christ. All the organizations and secret societies that you listed, and I could add to that list voluminously, they're all players in the counter-reformation to destroy any notion in the world that the Pope is Antichrist, the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist, which the Protestant reformers believed. And, And you have to destroy that knowledge. If you have any hope at all of making the the Pope the King of Kings and Lord of Lords on the earth, okay, you have to destroy historicism. You have to under you have to destroy the Protestant belief, and the only way you can do that is to destroy the Bible by perverting it and corrupting the prophecies, or simply making the Bible illegal, like the Vatican did. They went around burning these Bibles. The Inquisition went around and they had Bible burnings. Anybody caught with a Protestant Bible, <clears throat> with a Wycliffe Bible, or with a, a Luther Bible, uh, they were persecuted and killed, and their books, their Bibles were burned. That's the Dark Ages. That's when Rome was against knowledge. She wanted to have a monopoly on knowledge, and she wanted the people to know only about the Scriptures what they wanted the people to know. And it was when when God liberated the people from papal tyranny, and they began to print their own Bibles in their own languages so that for the first time in history, people could read for the first time in papal history, that the Bible could be read in in their own language. They didn't need a preacher. They didn't need a priest anymore. And they found out they didn't need a pope, for crying out loud. They had Christ. And then they all of a sudden came to the unanimous realization Indeed, the Pope is the Antichrist. The Waldenses were right. The Albigensians were right. The Hussites were right. Okay? And that's when light came into the world, when the Bible was finally 
translate it into the language of the people so they could read it for themselves rather than to be spoon-fed by the Roman priests who were trying to protect the papacy. And, and this history has been completely swept out of our history books. It's been completely swept out of our churches. And it makes all the difference. It makes all the difference in our understanding. And, it, and this knowledge proves preterism to be a lie. And it proves futurism to be a lie. And we're left with no other interpretation of the prophecies but the historicist interpretation. That which has been held by God's people ever since the days of Christ. You know, the Thessalonians were looking in the near future for the rise of Antichrist. We simply have to look in history for the rise of Antichrist. And it is the papacy. Now, people are going to say, well, Tom, you can repeat it a million times. It doesn't make it so. You're going to have to prove it. Okay, and now I'll prove it. Turn to Daniel chapter 9. And I won't, I won't read the whole chapter, but I'll tell you that Daniel is on his face before the Lord. Israel is in the Babylonian captivity. Daniel has read the book of Jeremiah and realized that God has prophesied through the prophet Jan uh, Jeremiah that Israel will suffer 70 years of, of, of captivity in Babylon for their sins of idolatry. And forgetting God's law. They're being punished. That's why they're in Babylonian captivity. And Daniel confesses his own sins, and he confesses the sins of Israel. And while he was yet speaking to the Lord in prayer, God sent an angel to give Daniel some understanding. And here it is. The prophecy that was given to Daniel begins in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24. Now, if everybody will just take a second and grab a piece of paper and a pencil, we're going to do a simple addition of three numbers. Actually, two columns of three numbers. And you can even write these numbers down if you're ready to go, and I'll review them as we go along so nobody will be left behind. The prophecy of Daniel speaks of 70 weeks of time, 70 weeks of years. Okay, write on your piece of paper, 70 weeks equals 7 times 70 equals 490 years. Now let me, let me read it again slowly so everybody can write this down. 70 weeks equals 7 times 70. And everybody knows they can do any math. 7 times 70 is 490. Okay, we're talking about a 490-year period of time. And also I want to preface this by stating this prophecy is all about the, the coming of the Messiah. This prophecy is about Christ. Antichrist is nowhere even mentioned in this prophecy, as you'll see as we continue. All right, the, the prophet is giving Daniel a 70 times 7 period of time, or 490 year time span for the prophecy to be completely fulfilled. I mean, if, you're, if, 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 if the angel of the Lord is going to come and prophesy that something's going to happen, and it's going to happen within so many years, it's important to write it down. It's important to remember exactly what he said so Satan can't deceive you, right? So he says in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Now let me just stop right there. This 70 weeks period of time is 70, 70 periods of 7 weeks or 7 years. 70 periods of 7 years. Now, this isn't disputed in the Christian world. All, all the Christian churches agree that this is talking about 70 times 7 years, or 490 years. Everybody understands this. It's not disputed by anybody so far as I know. All right, 70 weeks, or 70 periods of 7 years, 
for 490 years are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. So the, the angel setting before Daniel a timeline, and there's an events that are going to happen within that specific 490 year period of time, and it's going to have to do with Daniel's people, the Israelites, and upon the holy city. It doesn't concern anybody else but the Israelites and Jerusalem, thy people and thy holy city. Now the purpose of this, what is going to take place in this 490 year period is explained further. It says, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the Most Holy. So a lot of things are going to characterize this 490-year period of time. First of all, they're going to bring an end to the transgression. And it's up to us to, to determine what that transgression is. Okay? Idolatry. False worship. After all, isn't that why they were in Babylonian captivity? They were worshiping images and idols. And they had forgotten God's law. Okay? And to make an end of sins. Now, it's not saying that men are going to stop sinning, but that the sins are going to be forgiven. Right? We're talking about the coming of Messiah. Didn't he wash our robes clean with, the, with his own blood and, and wash our sins away? Yes, right. To make an end of sins. And to make reconciliation for iniquity. In other words... He's going to reconcile us to God. That's what Christ did, did he not? And to bring in everlasting righteousness. Now, everybody's going to say, well, everlasting righteousness didn't begin when Jesus came to Jerusalem to give up his life. Oh, yes, it did. He said, we are washed with, by, by his blood. The sins do not exist. They've been cast as far as the east is from the west. And his kingdom began then, remember the scripture said, and they added to the kingdom of God daily, didn't they? So there was a heavenly kingdom that was opened when Christ came. Well, and that's I, 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 I got to jump on that one because I, I have spoken to this. I didn't get into it as much as I expect you're fixing to. But when Christ was before Pontius Pilate, he made a very, very interesting thing in it, like it frequently seems to in Scripture. One word. But now is my kingdom not of this world. Now. Yeah. Transitionary period. Which side of the cross are we on? And when he resurrected, different matter. The other side. I just wanted to get that out. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, that doesn't contradict anything we're talking, we're talking about. We're talking about an eternal heavenly kingdom. Christ opened that kingdom. And it is everlasting righteousness. That kingdom will never end, and there will be no sin in it. Okay? And that people were added to that kingdom as those who God had given to Christ, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And they started coming to him. People began to realize that Christ was the Lamb of God, fulfilled all the prophecies of the Messiah, and washed their sins away, and opened a heavenly kingdom for them to dwell in. Okay, there's your everlasting righteousness. And to seal up the vision and the prophecy, to seal up the vision and the prophecy. In other words, no more is to be done. This prophecy at the end of the 490 years is going to be wrapped up. Nobody's going to be able to add to this or take anything away from it. What, what, what happens when you're done reading a scroll? You roll it back up and you put the seals back on it, don't you? There's nothing to add. There's nothing to take away. So you seal up the scroll. Well, this vision is like a scroll. Once it is read, the whole 490 years is laid out before you so you can read it and understand it for yourself. There's nothing to add. The end. You roll up the scroll. You put the seals back on it. So don't let anybody add to this prophecy. It's just like all the other prophecies of God. Don't add to my word and don't take away from it. If you do, you'll deceive yourself. 
Okay, so he's going to seal up the vision. He's going to make everything in this vision that Daniel sees come to pass. Everything that has been prophesied in this prophecy right here is going to come to pass. And 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 it's indicated here somebody's going to try to molest this, and they have, and they've done it in the churches. And it's time for us to understand we need to read this prophecy again open that seal, read this prophecy again, and make sure that somebody hasn't added to it or molested it in any way, either taking anything away from it or adding to it. This prophecy is going to be fulfilled, the vision is going to be fulfilled, and that's going to be wrapped up. And don't let anybody ever deceive you that it's not fulfilled yet. You see where I'm going with this? We're told that the 70th week of Daniel doesn't come till the end of time. Right here it says to seal up the vision and the prophecy is simply telling us this is it. When the end of the 490 years is over, the 70th week of Daniel is over. This prophecy is over. Well, Tom, one of the reasons why I had James Lloyd on was very much about this. And, and, and I don't mean to get you off track because it's, it's with Daniel 2. And it, mm -hmm. if, if one reads Daniel 2 very, very closely, because what has happened, and, and I don't want to get off on a bunny trail because I threw this out at you and we really haven't had time to talk about it. So I, I hate to say you'll just have to take my word for it now unless you want to go down that bunny trail. But the point I'm getting at is when, when we read Daniel 2, there are four kingdoms mentioned there, and four only. Okay? There's the head of gold, which is Nebuchadnezzar, the right. chest and iron, uh, chest and arms of, of silver, the belly and thighs of, of brass and in the legs of iron and of clay. And yet, what happens because of Daniel 7, and that last beast with the ten horns, uh, they trans... I don't know what they do. They co-mingle the two to where the ten toes become these ten kingdoms. And that's not ten kingdoms. It says, in the days of these kings. And if you read, the only kings that have been mentioned were the four before. The ten toes are the disillusion of the Roman Empire. But where I'm going with this is, and then he says, I beheld until a rock was cut out of the mountain without hands. And again, like you said, I don't know anybody that says that's other than that that is Christ. And smote the image upon the feet. And it smashed it and there was no place found for it. Anymore. There's your first clue. No place found for it. Anymore. But then it says the rock grew and grew and grew and became a mountain and filled the whole earth. Yeah. Okay. And that is, and when did that happen? Right at the disillusion, or as you alluded to earlier, what I like to call passing off the scepter, from the Caesars to the papacy. But nonetheless, it was the disillusion of that. And for those wondering what those ten are, that's the, the ten toes. If, if you look into Roman when it was uh, dissolving, you had the barbarians at gate, the Goths, the Visigoths, the Vandals, so on and so forth. There's ten of them, just coincidentally. But I just wanted to throw that in there with that kingdom bit, because a lot of people are not used to this. They're waiting with this futurism on everything to for to come, and, okay, sorry. Yeah. Okay, well, we, we these are all things that we'll talk about as time progresses, but I want to stick with the, the, the where the confusion lies that is coming from the churches today regarding Daniel's 70-week prophecy and this idea that we're still waiting for the 70th week of Daniel to take place. And, and, and I, want, I want your listeners to give every opportunity to hear the truth about this. It's in your face. It's plain as day. It's in black and white right here. It doesn't take any doctor of divinity to understand this. It doesn't take any sp special qualifications. It certainly doesn't need a priest to interpret this prophecy for us. We can read it for ourselves. The Bible was written for an eighth grader. Okay? So, so they're going to bring an end of, finish the transgression. They're going to make an end of sins. They'll re make reconciliation for iniquity. to bring everlasting righteousness. Seal up the vision and the prophecy. And to anoint the most holy. To anoint the most holy. Now, who's the most holy? It's God, right? And Jesus said, I and my Father are one. So the Messiah, since this prophecy is about the Messiah and no one else, we're talking about the anointing of Jesus Christ. Okay, we're going to 
he's going to be recognized when he is anointed. And we know the story of John the Baptist, how, how he baptized Jesus in the River Jordan. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is what Daniel was waiting for. This is what this 70-week prophecy was to, to give the Jews an undisputable timeline. So accurate and so detailed in its description that had they read this prophecy, they could have almost determined to the day when Jesus was going to be baptized in the Jordan River. Okay? There's no mention of Antichrist anywhere in this prophecy, as we'll see as we continue. Now, in verse 25, it says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince, not Antichrist, unto Messiah the Prince, Jesus Christ, shall be seven weeks, three score and two weeks, the street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. All right, let's break it down in small pieces so that we can all understand it, that we don't need anybody to explain this to us anymore. First of all, the angel wants Daniel to understand his own prophecy. This isn't going to be a mystery to Daniel. Daniel, at the end of this prophecy, is going to understand everything that he's been told. And it says, from the, if we're talking about a 490 years period of time, a specific period of time, if it's going to be reliable, if it's going to help us uh, 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 recognize the Messiah when he comes, it has to have a starting date, doesn't it? When do you, when do you start the stopwatch, right? If you don't know when to start the stopwatch, you don't know when Messiah is going to come, do you? All right. It said, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem, unto uh, Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again, the wall, and even in troublous times. So they're looking for a starting time. When do we start the clock? Well, when the decree comes forth to rebuild the city. Now, many books have been written, and they all argue about what the date of this was so that they can either count the days or count the years. And isn't it funny, all of these books contradict. They all come up with a different answer. But all we have to do is look at the New Testament. The New Testament is the best source of history that we'll find, especially in, in determining who was the Messiah and when did he come. All right, first of all, it breaks this 490-year period down into three specific periods. Now, this is where we're going to do some math. It says, uh, from, the, from the command to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince, Jesus Christ, shall be first seven weeks. In other words, 49 years, if every week represents seven years, Seven of those will be 49 years. So write on your piece of paper, seven weeks equals 49 years. Okay, that first seven-week period of time was for the rebuilding of the temple, as history bears witness. That occurred first. And immediately succeeding, immediately, no, no, no parenthetical pause between the 49th year and the 50th year, or between the seven weeks and the 62 not, uh, weeks, they were concurrent. They are, or rather, they were consecutive. One began, and, you know, God doesn't start and stop his clock, okay? Once the clock's ticking, the prophecy is counting down. God doesn't play tricks on his people. He's not the author of confusion. So first there's a period of seven weeks, which we know was the length of time it took to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Then from that period, immediately began another clock, counting down the 69 weeks. There were 62 weeks. Now, the, the scripture says here, three score and two weeks. And for those who don't know, a, a score is 20. Okay, If you're going to buy a score of apples, you buy 20 apples. All right, three score is 
60 or 3 times 20. And two weeks, it says. So we're talking about 62 weeks of years, just like the previous seven weeks of years. The seven weeks of years equal 49 years, as we already wrote on our paper. Now we're dealing with the consecutive 62 weeks that come immediately after the 70th week, or the seven weeks. And these seven weeks, if you do the math, 62 times 7 is 434 years, literal years. So, first, the seven weeks, or 49 years to rebuild the temple, and then 62 weeks, three, four, and two weeks, until Messiah the Prince. Okay? So 49 years plus 434 years, which is 62 times 7, equals 69 weeks, or 483 years. Now remember, the prophecy is for 490 years. So we're missing one week, aren't we? A seven-year period of time. But look what it says when we read further. It says, And after the, the three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. In other words, killed. Now let's stop right there and, and, and break this up so we can easily understand what we've just read. It says, After the three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. Well, remember, before the 62 weeks, there were seven weeks. Okay, that had elapsed for the building of the temple. And then from that point, another 62 weeks, or 434 years, and after that, Messiah would be cut off. Well, if you add the original seven weeks, the first division of the, of the 70 weeks of Daniel was seven weeks. The second division was 62 weeks, totaling 69 weeks. So it's just as legitimate to say that Daniel chapter 9 verse 26 really literally means and after the, after, uh, uh, the 69th week shall Messiah be cut off. Okay, 62 weeks plus 7 weeks equals 69 weeks. 49 years plus 434 years equals 483 years. So we've got one week left and it says after the 69th week, Messiah should be cut off. Now, common sense dictates that if it's after the 69th week, it must be during the 70th week, right? Is Am I confusing anybody? Not here. No, it says after... The three score and two weeks, and we have to understand that that means also after the seven weeks, too. Because that came first. Then the three score and two weeks succeeded it. Altogether, we're talking about 69 weeks. Or 434 years. Or, or, or rather, 483 years. So after the 483rd year, or after the 69th week was complete... Messiah would be cut off. Ladies and gentlemen, that leaves no room for any other understanding but that Christ was cut off during the 70th week. Now, now how, can, how can we believe then, if this is true, how can we believe then that the 70th week is yet to come? How can we believe that God who immediately succeeded the seventh week, the seven weeks with the 62 weeks, all of a sudden, without telling us beforehand, he's going to separate the 70th week from the 69th week by 2,000 years? It's not a part of the prophecy. Who added that to the prophecy? Who opened the seals in the, of this vision and this prophecy and added a parenthetical period of 2,000 years before, be, between the end of the 69th week and the beginning of the 70th week, when this prophecy clearly says in no mis unmistakable terms that Christ was cut off after the 69th week. 
that literally means that he had to be cut off or crucified during the 70th week. There's no parenthetical pause of 2,000 years. God is not the author of confusion. This prophecy began with the command to rebuild Jerusalem to Messiah the Prince, and it ended at the end of Christ's ministry. The 70 weeks of Daniel are over. Now, now, one of your astute listeners will say, but, 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 but wait a minute, Tom. Christ's ministry was only for three, three and a half years. You still got three and a half years to account for. That's exactly right, but that's not what the prophecy says. It says in the midst of the week he will be cut off. After three and a half years, after he was anointed, the most holy was anointed by John the Baptist, three and a half years later he atoned for our sins. He brought an end of iniquity. He brought in everlasting righteousness, the kingdom of heaven. He reconciled us to God. He did all of it. He satisfied the vision and the prophecy. Seal it up. Don't let anybody add to it or take away from it. But somebody says, well, well that's the, that gets us up to the, to the end of the three and a half years of the 70th week. What about the remaining three and a half years? Since we're talking about the 70 week is seven years, you have to be consistent, Tom. You're absolutely right. I do. When Christ died, he rose and was rescinded into heaven. And 50 days later, the Spirit of Christ continued to c- confirm the covenant of the kingdom with the believers. Did he not? Was Christ absent from the earth? Yes, materially he was, but not spiritually. He descended upon the people as of tongues of fire, and they continued under the power and anointing of that Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, to testify of the kingdom. And they continued to testify of the kingdom of Christ to the Jews who slew him right up until the very last day of the 490th year, when Stephen finally, for the last time, witnessed once again to the Sanhedrin that they had slain their Messiah, Jesus died after the first three and a half years, and Stephen consummated the prophecy when they stoned him. In the spirit and anointing of Christ, he testified before the Sanhedrin that they had slain, they had wickedly slain their own Messiah. And it says, and they rent their clothes. Well, what does that indicate? That they fully comprehended that they had indeed Slain their own Messiah. That Jesus was the Christ, the Lamb of Almighty God, the fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. And they ripped their clothes. But that's not all they should have done. They should have gotten down on their knees before, before Stephen and before God Almighty and confessed their sins. But they didn't. They stoned Stephen, shut him up. And that's when the gospel went to the Gentiles. Now you have the prophecy fulfilled. Remember the 70-week prophecy of Daniel was for the, the Israelites, Daniel's people, and for Jerusalem. And that's when the gospel went to the Gentiles. Prophecy fulfilled perfectly and completely, just like Daniel prophesied it. There's the end of the 70th week of Daniel. He was anointed at the beginning of the 70th week, immediately after the 69th week, just as it says in verse 26. After the 69th week shall Messiah be cut off, exactly three and a half years after the 69th week. Well, Tom, something else that's interesting to me is that what it says immediately after where you, you've stopped there, but not for himself. Absolutely. And, and, and who was he cut off for? He was stricken and smitten for us, people. Right. He was cut off, but not for himself. Yeah. And what have they done? They have taken this Messiah, the one they rejected, and have transformed him through a bunch of hocus-pocus 
we can define that word later and where it <laughs> I know where of, you're going with that. Yeah, through a bunch of hocus pocus, now they've taken Messiah and he's the Antichrist. And I'm sorry, that gets me bunched up. And then I gotta get these futurists coming blah, 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 blah. and then they start this this uh Daniel seventieth week. Look, we're told that the gospel is so simple a child can understand it. Any of you really understand Daniel seventieth week? Oh, they make these fancy little things. Uh, nobody can understand it. If you had a brain scientist a, 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 a rocket scientist and a brain surgeon they can't understand Daniel 70 weeks because it's fiction anyway I'm done I'm sorry I just wanted to cut off but not for himself and then they turned right around and they convert Christ the anointed into the for to come antichrist unbelievable unbelievable you see, we need to come to Christ as little child an eight, an eight year old child could read this as it is written, having never been polluted by pastors and churches, could read this prophecy exactly as it's written and debunk the whole future 70th week of Daniel that we teach in the churches. It's plain English. Any eighth grader could read this prophecy and come up to the right answer that Jesus was the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. The 70 weeks are over. They were over 2,000 years ago. This prophecy was sealed up 490 years after it began, at the decree to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. Just said, seven years, 70, seven years, the first period of division of this 70-week period. The first seven weeks were 49 years to rebuild the, the, the temple. 62 weeks from that point until the coming of Messiah the Prince. And after the 69th week, he was cut off. Well, well, exactly three and a half years after his baptism and anointing. And then the gospel came to us through the Holy Spirit for the last three and a half years, confirming the covenant of the kingdom. And then the gospel went to the Gentiles after they stoned Stephen. So the, 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 the Sanhedrin sealed their doom. When instead of repenting, after they once realized that Jesus was indeed their Messiah, that they had slain their own Messiah... Once they acknowledged that and then failed to repent, God had no more to do with it. And the gospel went to the Gentiles. Yes, confirming okay. the covenant, as in the new covenant. Yes. That, that, that Christ spoke of. This is this is my blood shed a covenant, the new covenant. Yes. Uh now now just the covenant in his blood, not the covenant of lambs and goats that were imperfect, that could not Amen. wash away sin. Amen. Okay, so what does that do to animal sacrifices? They're worthless. They were always worthless. They were only given so that they, people would know who Jesus was when he came, because he would give up his own life, his own blood. God even told him, he said, I'm, I'm sick of your sacrifices. They're a stench in my nostrils. Yes, he did. And why was it a stench? They simply didn't understand that he was trying to teach them about Jesus when they gave those animal sacrifices. They thought, just like the heathen do today, that making a sacrifice on an altar gives you grace. Okay? You know where I'm going with this, don't you, Lord? Yeah. That yeah. There's, still, there's, there's still some sacrifice to be made for sin, whether it's a blood sacrifice on an altar like the Jews used to do, or whether it's a bloodless sacrifice on an altar like the Roman Catholics do. There is no more sacrifice for sin. If you're sacrificing a piece of bread, or if you're sacrificing a lamb or a goat, you have not received the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of Almighty God. You're just as much in rebellion against God as were the Jews, who rejected Jesus, and having rejected their lamb, their divine lamb, the one that God sent to them, the one that Daniel prophesied about, they had no other choice but to continue animal sacrifices, even after God ripped the veil of the temple from top to bottom. Having once received or rejected Jesus Christ, they had no other option for the remission of their sins but to continue animal sacrifices. And here we are today, here we are today talking about the, the new nation state of Israel created in 1948, and all of us Christians are praying that the Jews will come to their Messiah, and we've got to have a temple, we've got to have a priesthood, we've got to have animal sacrifices again, we've got to have a treaty so that the Jews can have temple mount, they can build their temple and start their animal sacrifices again so that they can be saved. But are they going to be saved? 
Only one if, way. If, if, if animal sacrifices were an efficacious atonement for sin, then why did God have the temple of Jerusalem destroyed in 70 A.D.? Why did he disperse all the Jews? Why didn't he leave them right there in Jerusalem with the temple standing so they could continue their animal sacrifices after they rejected Jesus? You know, the whole Christian world is convinced that once these Jews build a temple in Jerusalem and begin animal sacrifices again, that the Shekinah glory of God is going to stand over the Holy of Holies in the temple and, and confirm these sacrifices. And I'm going to tell you something. If anything stands over the Holy of Holies of this new temple that they're proposing to build over Jerusalem, it will not be the Shekinah glory of God. Well, Tom, you know, it's interesting because when, when Christ was talking, I can't remember this Sanhedrin who he's talking to right now, he says, tear down this temple, the, the temple, tear down this temple, and in three days I, Christ, will rebuild it. And they understood not, so he didn't even bother answering them because it's not made with stones anymore, people. Not made with hands. The temple of God is not made with hands. We are the temple of Almighty God. Each one of us is a vessel of the Holy Spirit. And we either receive Jesus Christ and, and accept his atonement, or we don't. But there's no more sacrifices for sin. There's no more animal sacrifices. There's no more Eucharist. There's no more holy masses. It's all a lie. Every bit of it. And for any Christian who understands the scriptures, particularly this prophecy and the confirmation of the fulfillment of this prophecy in the New Testament, can come to no other conclusion. But this whole idea of the Jews building a temple, beginning animal sacrifices again, is an abomination before the Lord. It's a confirmation of the original rejection of Christ. If they have Jesus, why do they need an animal sacrifice? I mean, even the Protestants know you don't make sacrifices. And unlike the Catholics, when they take communion, it's not a sacrifice. It's literally a, a memorial of Jesus. No true Bible-believing Christian would offer another sacrifice. That's a renunciation of Jesus. That's a tacit renunciation of Jesus. That's right. His blood was not enough. And therefore, I submit that this abomination, which maketh desolate, is indeed what we're talking about here. Because when you start taking goat's blood and dove's blood and try to pour it on top of the Lord Jesus Christ, I You give polluted it. Thank you. That's right. You polluted it. And it's no more fit to be a sacrifice. That's the truth, ladies and gentlemen. That's the truth, and we've been told lie after lie after lie. And here you've got the United States government, the United States military, the United States State Department, the CIA, and all the, all the governments of the world all concerned about Jerusalem. It's a waste of time. The only, the only thing they're concerned about Jerusalem for is to put up a phony Christ. A phony Christ, that's what it's all about. They want to put up a phony Christ. Now, let's go to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Where did the confusion come in? Who opened up this scroll, broke the seals, and added to the words of the prophecy of this prophecy? Daniel chapter 9, verse 27 says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Well, who's the he spoken of here? Daniel chapter 9, 26 says, the verse right above it, it says, and after three score and two weeks, in other words, after 69 weeks, that is, during the 70th week, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. So the prophet Daniel is given by the angel that there's going to come a war right after Messiah is cut off. 
And that war took place in 70 AD. They destroyed the city and the sanctuary and left the city desolate. As a matter of fact, Jesus desolated the temple before he was even rejected. He, he wept over Jerusalem. And he said, your house is left unto you desolate. Not God's house. Your house is left unto you desolate. In other words, Jesus has left the temple. He's been, he knows he's going to be rejected. It's a prophecy. You're going to reject me. And without me in the Holy of Holies, without my blood on the mercy seat, if you reject me, your house is desolate. All, all it has is a ripped veil and animal blood, which never took away sin. Your house is left unto you desolate. If you reject me, your temple is worthless. Your temple on Mount Moriah is worthless, and it's no more use to God, and he's going to destroy it. And it happened. The people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. That happened in 70 AD. Now, who was the prince that came? Prince Titus of the Roman 10th Legion. Okay? He destroyed the city and the sanctuary. That's recorded in history. Nobody disputes this. And now it says in verse 27, And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblations, or he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. That's a seven-year period of time, right? A week is seven years of time. We're talking about the 79th, uh, the, the 70th week. This is after the 69th week. Christ confirmed the covenant of the kingdom with the people for one week, seven years. And again, your people are going to say, no, 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 Jesus was only in his ministry for three and a half years. Well, that's if you exclude the spirit of Christ who continued Christ's ministry until the stoning of Stephen three and a half years later which makes a complete seven-year period of time, the 70th week. You see, Bible prophecy has already been fulfilled in history. There's no mistake about it. A child could read this prophecy and understand it. And it says, And the people of the prince shall come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now, Satan has twisted this to believe that this is speaking of Antichrist. But it's not. It's just simply speaking of Prince Titus of the Roman 10th Legion. It's recorded in all the history books. Nobody needs to be con uh, confused about this. Who, is, who wants to confuse us about this? Well, look, there's a whole bunch of Jews and a whole bunch of other people in the world that don't want us to believe that Jesus was the fulfillment of this prophecy. They rejected Christ. They still reject Christ. They have another gospel and another sacrifice, whether it be an animal sacrifice or a piece of bread. And they don't like the fulfillment of this prophecy. Because this prophecy leaves no room for doubt that it was Jesus who was the Messiah, the Prince, and that he came right on schedule after the 69th week, during the 70th week. As a matter of fact, he was baptized, anointed, the Most Holy was anointed by John the Baptist in the, in the River Jordan, which began, officially began the 70th week of Daniel. Three and a half years later, he caused the sacrifices and the oblations to cease when he gave up his own life for us. That's what the whole intent of Jesus' sacrifice was, to put an end to the transgression, to put an end to animal sacrifices that couldn't take away our sins. Well, Tom, I, I got to pipe in here too because again with this, and and it says right there the the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. It it did cease, and yet they have this off where we got to have this other temple again, and then we go through this again, and then it stops. And yet when you ask people, and and I did, and if they listen in the archives or now I don't know whatever, they will probably know what it is. I asked why. Has animal sacrifice stopped? 
uh, well, we don't have a temple to do it in. Well, you know, uh, that that's kind of convenient except for a couple things. One, if that is the case, I would submit that if you're under the law, you best have been a butcher and stuff all along. Because I find nothing in the law that says, you know, if you don't have a temple. In fact, you go in the old, they did it in a tent, a tabernacle, a tent out in the wilderness. And so even if you buy into that, they're in rank violation of the technical law, which was a type and a shadow of things for to come. I hope right. people are getting this because this fits in so and you put this so succinctly. That's right. And not only did they not have a temple, they didn't have the mercy seat to sprinkle the blood on to atone for all the sins of Israel. The sacrificial system could not function without the temple, without the, the, the Holy of Holies, without the mercy seat, the, the, uh, uh, the Ark of the Covenant. The sacrificial system could not continue. And to make sure that the animal system, the animal sacrificial system came to an abrupt end after Jesus gave up the ghost on the cross, God ripped the veil of that temple which made the temple, and I'm going to use a strong term here, but I don't want to be misunderstood about it, it made the temple a death trap. Okay? Everybody knows that only the high priest of Israel, once a year on the Day of Atonement, could go pat, could pass through the veil and sprinkle the, 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 the blood sacrifice on the mercy seat. And if he was not perfectly washed clean or if he saw the the holy of holies outside past the veil he would have been killed that was the law god would have slain him dead but um, uh, and so, gonna... so god so god ripped the veil of the temple to actually put a uh, 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 a critical, critical and final end to animal sacrifices. If anybody walked into that temple with the veil swung open and the Holy of Holies open and the Ark of the Covenant there, and who would cast their eyes upon the Holy, Holy of Holies and the Ark of the Covenant with unwashed hands and unwashed eyes, they would have been killed just like the high priest. Well, the other thing too, Tom, now, not only did the Lord rent that veil, there was something else, very germane, very pertinent, very indispensable also that was rent. And you mentioned the high priest. You remember where he got so angry and he rent his garment. That garment was never to be rent. That's right. And when it was rent, it ended that priesthood. Leviticus yeah. priesthood, gone. Benito. That is why Christ came through the order of of Melchizedek, by the way, people want to hear it forever, forever. That's in the New Covenant, not the old one that waxed away and is now gone, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, for, uh, anyway, I, I'm going to mute out. Uh, NJ, I'm going to let you take over because I'm I'm really, Tom, I, I, I'm aware of this, except that you, you have put it so succinctly, and I am, I am so saddened by how many people have bought into this and get positively militant about this, and get yeah. all bunch of, I, I'm almost in tears. I, I'm beside myself. Uh, so I'll let you go and go, please. Okay. All right. So am I on here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh. <laughs> well, I tell you what, I just, I've been putting in little phrases here and there throughout this, uh, things that lit me up like a light bulb. We are the temple built without hands. No need for a man-made temple. Yeah. Love that. Just love that. Yeah. And how can people not see this? You know, I'm with well, Lori. It, they, I'm with Lori. It does hurt. Sure it hurts. Yeah, it does. It does hurt because people... I've been, I've been lied to you all my so life. Confused. Yeah. It's hurtful. The people I that we trust most in our well, well, Tom, I want to I want to clarify. This is not hurt, been lied to, been there, done that. I'm over that. I'm hurt. I am very saddened by the people that a teach this, and even more so, I think, are the people on mass that have bought into this 
big, fat lie and turn the Lord Jesus Christ into Antichrist. I mean, I, I can't... I, that, that's what I'm heard about. Sure. They have prepared God's people now to accept another Christ. By taking Christ out of this one, out of this prophecy, and putting Antichrist in his place. And this this is the confusion. It says, and he, uh, this is Daniel chapter nine verse twenty seven, and it and and it all centers around what identity you give to the second word in that verse, that little two letter word, he, H E. Who is the he spoken of there? Now remember, this prophecy so far has been about Christ and nobody but Christ. Antichrist has never even been alluded to anywhere in this prophecy. This is all about the coming of the Messiah. From the going forth of command to rebuild Jerusalem to the Messiah, the prince should be seven weeks plus 62 weeks. The 70th week will be the start of Messiah's ministry for one week. Together you have 70 weeks. It's all about the Messiah. It's all about the temple. and It's all about the Jews. Israel. Antichrist is never mentioned here, not even alluded to, directly or indirectly. Yes, it takes a parenthetical shift in the middle of Daniel chapter 9 to verse 26, and it talks about the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And we all know from history that was Prince Titus, and the people that came with him were the tenth legion. But who is the subject? of that parenthetical phrase beginning in the middle of verse 26 and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary who destroyed the city and the sanctuary did the prince did Titus go around toppling all the bricks all the big stones of the temple no it was the people that he brought with him the tenth legion that did that okay people is plural the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The people shall come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. The people belong to the prince, Prince Titus. Okay, but now it says in verse 27, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Well, we certainly know since people were the ones who overthrew the city and the sanctuary, it can't refer to the people as he and it certainly doesn't refer to Prince Titus. Prince Titus didn't confirm any covenant with anybody for one week. It was Jesus who confirmed the covenant for one week. And that one week period of time began at his baptism in the River Jordan. And it was finished at the end of the seven-year period of time when the Holy Spirit departed after the stoning of Stephen and the gospel went to the Gentiles. So who is the he spoken of there in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27? It speaks of no one but Christ, Jesus Christ, the Lord, the Savior, the Lamb of God. You see, this prophecy doesn't talk about any Christ at all. It says, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. What covenant? The covenant of the kingdom, the new covenant in his blood, the perfect covenant. No more lambs and goats, that wasn't perfect. No more temple made with hands, that wasn't perfect. That was just a shadow of things to come. But he which is perfect has come, we put away these other things. And Jesus did confirm the covenant of his kingdom for one week, one seven-year period of time, beginning with his baptism and ending with the departure of of the gospel from Israel and Jerusalem and the temple and it went to the Gentile nations after having once for the last time rejected their Messiah and confirmed it after even acknowledging that they had slain their own Messiah and instead of repenting they stoned Stephen to shut him up mm, yeah okay so the week is over the, se the 70th week is over don't look in the future for a 70th week of Daniel. It doesn't exist. Otherwise, you're calling Daniel a liar. You're calling the angel that was sent to Daniel to give him this prophecy a liar. You're saying that the prophecy and the vision is not sealed up. 
It's not finished yet. We have seven years yet to go, and it's in the future yet. You see, somebody has broken up the seal of that vision that was completed. Somebody has broken the seal once again of that vision and prophecy and added to it. And God warned, do not add to or take away from my word. And I'm going to tie something in here, too, because worst of all, what they did is they took this Messiah and have tried to convert him into Antichrist. And what does the Lord himself say? I come in my own name and you receive me not. Another will come in his own name. Him he will receive. Wait up! That's right. What is that prophesying for Israel? That when they receive a Messiah, it'll be the wrong one. Exactly. Jesus told them to their face, I am your Messiah. Daniel said, I am your Messiah. The 70 weeks are right here and right now. Take me or leave me. And if you, if you leave me, then you've left yourself open for Satan to deceive you to receive another Messiah. One that comes in his own name. Not the one the Father gives him, but the one that he gives himself. I came in my Father's name, and you received me not. But there's one who was coming after me 2,000 years later. There's your parenthetical phrase of 2,000 years. There's one coming after me. After you build your temple, after you're, after you're the nation of Israel is restored, after you build your temple, after you get permission to build it, to make animal sacrifices again, then you'll receive your Messiah, but it'll be the wrong one. It'll be one who comes in his own name. And guess what that name is? I already know who it is. The Vicar of Christ. Not Christ. Not Jesus Christ. But the one on the earth who calls himself the Vicar of Christ. The replacement of Christ. That's what Vicar means. The, the, the replacement of Christ. Do you know what Vicar also means? Anti. A-N-T-I. Look up in any dictionary two words. Vicar, B-I-C-A-R, B-I-C-A-R, and the prefix anti, A-N-T-I. And you will see that they have the exact same meaning. The word vicar means replacement of. So the so the one on the earth who calls himself the vicar of Christ is literally causing, calling himself the replacement of Christ. And what is that but antichrist? And if you look up the, word, the prefix anti in any dictionary, A-N-T-I, it will say the replacement of. Vicar of Christ and antichrist are the same word, just spelled differently. And Antichrist, or, or, or rather, Vicar of Christ, is the official title of the papacy. Any Roman Catholic knows this. Any Roman Catholic will tell you the title of the Pope is the Vicar of Christ, which means the replacement of Christ, which also means Antichrist. Vicar of Christ means Antichrist. Do you realize that the Pope goes by the title Antichrist? It's out in the open. It's in your face. It's not a twisting of words. It's not playing word games. This is a, a, Anybody can look this up in a dictionary. The word vicar and the prefix ante mean exactly the same thing. So when the Pope calls himself vicar of Christ, he's calling himself antichrist. The Pope stands in front of the cameras of all the world and calls himself antichrist. And you know what? He's absolutely correct. So said all the Protestant reformers, so said the Waldenses, the Albigensians, the Hussites, the Protestants, everyone who was killed in history by the papacy through the Inquisitions and the Crusades preached from the rooftops that the Pope was Antichrist, and they were absolutely correct. And what do we see in the world today? We have the Pope all concerned about Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, they're building him an enclave, an enclave, Right within the old city, it's going to be like the Vatican. He'll be a, solid, uh, a sovereign king in Jerusalem. 
This is researchable. Anybody can search the mainstream media and find this out for themselves. He's been given jurisdiction within the old city of Jerusalem. And, and, uh, and uh, uh, Barry Chamish and his colleague, uh, uh, Bainerman, have determined and proved that Shimon Perez deeded Temple Mount to the Vatican in, what was it, 1993. So the Pope has had legal possession and ownership of Temple Mount in Jerusalem since 1993. There is, there is the one who will come in his own name. And the scripture says, and him you will receive. You rejected me. I came in my Father's name, and you received me not. You rejected me. But there is one who is coming in his own name who will come after me, and him you will receive. So all the people in the world that are praying for the Jews to return to the land and begin animal sacrifices again, which cannot take away sin, in a temple that's made with hands, in a kingdom of men, not a heavenly kingdom of Christ, it's all being it's all being fulfilled right before our very eyes. It was Jesus who caused the sacrifice and the oblations to cease when he gave up his own life on the cross in the middle of the seventieth week of Daniel. That seventieth week, that four hundred and ninetieth year ended with the stoning of Stephen. It's all over. Don't look in the future for a seven year great tribulation. The papacy has put God's people through tribulation for the last 1,500 years. This is the historicist view. You can only find the true biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist in history. Not in the preterist interpretation and twisting of these scriptures. Not in the futurist twisting and perversion of these scriptures, but in history. But Tom, I want to bring something else up here too, because when it comes to sacrifice, I'd, I'd have to go sift and sort. And some places talk about the daily, the daily yeah. sacrifice. And what most people are not aware of, they're they're aware of the uh, the mass. And and last time I did this, I had some, I guess she was a Catholic woman, wrote me a rather lengthy uh, email, wanted to educate me on what I'm about to say again, and that was definition of some words. But where I'm going to begin with is, you don't realize the Mass is celebrated, I'm quoting, celebrated daily in, in Catholicism. Now, most Catholics only practice it or observe it once a week, but it is celebrated daily. And as you brought up Vicar of Christ, the substitute Christ, the Antichrist, I'm going to bring up some other ones. Vatican, Vaticanus, divination, okay? Mass. And, and, and this is what she was trying to get me on. I just looked this up in a Latin, English, English, Latin dictionary. If you look up mass, the word comes from massa, meaning sacrifice. And if you look up, of course, host, it comes from hostia, which means victim. It is a bloodless sacrifice daily. It was practiced in ancient Babylon. Yeah. And, and, of course, there is no more sacrifice for sin, despite what the Catholics do with this phony sacrifice of the Mass every day in the Roman Catholic Church. It cannot wash away sins. Only Christ's blood can wash away sins. Animal sacrifices were insufficient. Blood sacrifices were insufficient. How could a bloodless sacrifice be sufficient? Many people, many people who call themselves Protestant and Evangelical don't pay much attention to the Roman Catholic Church. They don't know anything about it. And they would be shocked to realize that the thing that they call the Mass in the Roman Catholic Church is a literal sacrifice. It is believed in the Roman Catholic Church that when the priest elevates in his hands the little round piece of bread above his head, and proclaims the magic, the magic Latin phrase, hoc es inus corpus meus, which literally means this is the, the blood and body of Christ. That this bread at that time is transformed or transubstantiated. Its substance is changed from bread 